Greetings, friends and fellow travelers and life mastery aficionados. It's so great to have you here and welcome to Life Mastery TV, your source for inspiration, empowerment and fulfillment. My name is David McLeod and I am your Life Mastery Coach and I am author of the book A Life to Die For. I'm excited because today we're going to be talking about a really, really interesting topic. Now, our bodies are the vehicles that carry us through the physical portion of our lives. They are amazing and resilient structures that have some wonderful, and in fact, many would say miraculous properties and qualities and capabilities that we sometimes take for granted. At least I know I certainly have. And although many of us refer to our bodies as temples, I think it's sad to say that most of us don't really treat them with the reverence that they truly deserve. And as a result, it's not unusual for us to encounter physical challenges or other kinds of issues, anything ranging from minor injuries to diseases to chronic or life-threatening conditions. Well, today we're gonna to talk about this in some detail with a focus specifically on reclaiming the body temple. And my guest for today is a leading health facilitator who specializes in stress and chronic pain management, addiction recovery, meditation, and yoga. She is a yoga-informed recovery coach, a certified kundalini yoga teacher, an ancestral clearing practitioner, and an EFT tapping pra practitioner. And she focuses on helping people realize the power of their inherent healing. She is also the author of the wonderful book, The Way Through Chronic Pain, Tools to Reclaim Your Healing Power. And she's gonna offer uh, an opportunity later on today for you to get a, a copy of the introduction and the first chapter of that book for free. Anyway, my guest helps others to achieve the healing for themselves that she experienced directly from the work that she teaches. So please join me in extending a warm welcome to a gifted healer, Elizabeth Kipp. Welcome Elizabeth and thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much, so much David. It's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here today. So, yeah, and I'm, and I'm really glad you're here. And I just wanted to say I, I, I understand that you have been through some pretty interesting challenges in your own life. And I wonder if you could share with us a little bit of your journey that, that led you to this place of, of teaching about, you know, pain management and stress management and all that stuff. Oh, great question. Um, just a very quick thumbnail on my story. Um, I grew up in a household where um, there was a lot of avoiding emotion and oh, suppressing yeah. emotion. Mm -hmm. And uh, children were seen and not heard. And uh, uh, also there was alcoholism in the family. So there was a lot of volatility on the side of the parents. Um, and I, I didn't have any tools for that other than to just be quiet and hold everything. Um, that's really a prescription for chronic pain. But uh, later when I was 14, I, I was uh, was on, I was riding a horse and um, I got flipped off the horse and I landed on a rock and broke my fifth lumbar in my back. Oh my and, God. Uh, I actually walked away from that accident, um, but um, not knowing I'd broken something. But right. uh, Anyway, uh, uh, suffice it to say that 14 years later, it caught up with me and I needed surgery. And I started, I had a lot of surgery. Um, I had like three surgeries and then another one to uh, corrective surgery. And in all that, um, they treated me, the pain, they treated that with um, opiates and benzodiazepines. So opiates. Well, I've heard of opiates. I haven't heard of the other one, but I know that that's the typical approach in medical in Western medicine anyways, you know, diagnose it, fix it as best you can, and then deal with the drugs later. You know, that seems to be That's a it, Yeah. Benzodiazepine is an anti-anxiety. It's a class of anti-anxiety medication. Uh, and it's, it's a, it's a tricky one too. Um, it's, it's that they were made originally to only be taken sporadically over a two week period. And that's the science. But the doctors overrode that, and I was on this both of this combination for 32 years. People die from this. 
That's I was really lucky. I wanted yeah. to live through. Anyway, I was able to find a doctor to get me off all that stuff. And um, uh, almost seven years ago, and I saw what a problem was. So we not only got off the medication, I learned how to clear my pain. And uh, I really dedicated my life when I got out of that. I was like, wow, that this is what I'm doing for the rest of my life is helping people get out of this. Because I, I was a chronic pain patient for over 40 years. Right. Now, chronic pain, the definition that we're using is any pain, physical, emotional, spiritual, it doesn't matter to the body and the brain. They can't tell the difference. So any pain that's felt 15 days out of 30 for three months or more is chronic. And I maintain anybody that's had a, a grief experience is, is either in chronic pain or recovering from chronic pain. Um, the uh, National Institutes of Health uh, estimate that a quarter, a quarter of North America has chronic pain, including children, all across all socioeconomic levels. And the uh, World Health Organization estimates a fifth of the planet is in chronic pain. So it's a problem. It's yeah. this like silent epidemic that nobody's talking about. Sure, sure. Well, I can certainly resonate with a lot of what you said. And, um, you know, I'm sorry, I was a little distracted there. There was some noise coming through and I just had to had to deal with that. I think we're we're good now. But I, anyway, um, first of all, you mentioned a phrase that I heard a lot when I was a kid. Children are to be seen and not heard. And I think that was a pretty common thing for people of our age group, I think, um, who were brought up with, you know, very, very strict parents and and maybe people who did not express emotions all that well. And I know that was certainly true in my family. Um, it took me, you know, I just in my own case, I think I, a lot of my emotions were, were repressed. In fact, at one point in my life, I came to the realization that I had two emotions. I had anger and I had, I won't do that finger, but I had not anger. That was it. I was either on or off. If I, I either felt nothing or I felt anger. And but I didn't realize that was it. I thought that was, you know, that was the extent of emotion. I thought that was it. And it wasn't until I was in my 40s, uh, actually closer to 50s, that I was able to clear out all that anger and make space for all that other stuff. Meanwhile, there had been a lot of other things that had happened in my life in much the same way that it did for you. I didn't have I didn't fall off a horse or I didn't have to have, have that kind of an of an issue. But I noticed now that you think or now that you've mentioned it, I've noticed there were many times in my life when I had what I would classify as chronic pain. And my typical approach for dealing with that was lots of alcohol, you know, and it, I thank thank God that I, you know, I was able to get over that and work through the emotional issues and get down underneath and find, you know, some healing and also eliminate alcohol from my, my diet completely back in 2001. So, yeah, and it's it's a journey. It's a journey. So I honor you for taking on for yourself the idea of becoming an expert in this whole uh, this whole world of chronic pain and helping people to heal from whatever issues they might have. Let, let me give you the impetus for that, so you understand. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is what happened. I went to treatment. Uh, to a treatment center to help this doctor get me off the, the pain medicine. And while I was in pain track, I was always at pain track in the afternoon. We had a population of 100 people that were going through treatment at the time, 100 patients. 20 of us were in pain track, and the other 80 went to relapse school. So I never got to go to relapse school. And I asked my counselor, what's the story with relapse? Because I'm not getting the information. And she said, there's an 80% chance that you'll relapse. And I looked at her and I said to myself, I'm doomed. I didn't like the odds. And sure. the second thing I said, having started as a social scientist in college, the second thing I said was, what's wrong with this model? Is it, there yeah. something we can do to, you know, move the needle on this thing a little? And so that's in that moment, I dedicated my life. I said to myself, if I survive, this treatment, because it was a little iffy, uh, that coming off that medicine was tricky. Right. If I survived this, 
that's what I'm going to dedicate my life to. And that's how that happened. And congratulations on your clean time, on your sobriety. That's it's, it's a big deal. It is. It is. So uh, just a, a clarification. You mentioned, I think you said the word pain track. Is that right? Is oh, that, yeah. Was, can you yeah, describe what that means? I wasn't sure what you meant by that. It was a pain management program that they had in the treatment center. And only 20, only 20 of us in that population of 100 went to that program. And I'm, right. that's why I went. I went for that program. Right. And, um, uh, and I, anyway, so, yeah. yeah. Just want to make sure I understood the term correctly and, you know, make sure our, our listeners can, can figure that out as well. So, yeah, that's quite a journey. And 80% relapse, that's, that's pretty uh, discouraging, isn't it? Well, it was to me at the time. Um, but I, I'll say the other thing. My doctor who took us through the program and his, uh, a, 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 the people that helped him, they said this, they said, here are the tools. And they gave us these tools to help us manage our stress better. And they said, you have to use them every day. And I was like, okay, I will. That's going to help. Maybe that will help me. So I, um, I walked out of that program with a tool belt. And then I gathered a few more tools on my way in the, in the next couple of years, I gathered a few more tools that were helpful. And, um, and I use the tools every day. And I talk about that in my book. It's, of it's, uh, you have to use the tools every day. It's, mm-hmm. it's the way it actually, is. Actually do that again, hold that book up so we can just see it. And it's called the way through chronic pain tools to reclaim your healing power. Looks like a great book, and I know that you've you, you're going to give us a link later so people can uh, download a, a couple of free chapters, the introduction and chapter one from that book. Is that right? That's correct. So hang around, folks. You're going to get that toward towards the end of the show today, and uh, that's awesome. So you you learn some tools in this in this pain program, and then you understood that you had to use them every day. And then you say you, you, you gathered new tools as you went forward in your journey. Now, I'm just curious. Uh, you, you mentioned that that was quite a few years ago when all that started. Um, and that, at that time, the relapse rate was 80%. Now, in today's numbers, is the number still the same or has, has there been some improvement in that? Same number. Right. Same so number. you got your work cut out for you. We both do. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, it's a pretty sad thing. I mean, if, if only 20% of the people who are in chronic pain actually find some relief that doesn't involve addiction to some kind of substance, uh, that's a pretty sad statement of, of affairs, mm-hmm. I think. Uh, and, and boy, I sure hope we can do something to improve that. Now, I know that you talk a lot about all kinds of different things. And one of the tools that you mentioned and we, we discussed is this idea of ancestral clearing. Can you tell me a little bit about that and what's involved with that? And you know, why, why on earth would anybody need to do that? Oh, I can. I would like to back up just for a minute and address oh, yeah. the, um, the title of the, of the talk, which is Reclaiming the Body Temple, if I could. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just, wanna, uh, I just wanna read just a little passage from my book because uh, the words just flow together so beautifully. I can't do any better about okay. this topic. The body and the breath are always in the present moment, but we chronic pain sufferers go to great lengths to dissociate from what we're feeling physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Our sense of safety is so threatened that we collapse our breath and our self-esteem. Our connection to our friends, our family, ourselves, and our higher power is sorely tested even to the breaking point. Chronic pain steals our attention away from everything but itself. Our power is greatly diminished as we grapple with the forces it brings to bear. We lose track of the present moment, becoming hooked by our past and harried by what we imagine about our future. Our breath is shortened, so we forget how to relax into the long exhale. When our breathing pattern becomes dysfunctional, We lose our ability to nourish the body. 
When we dissociate from the body, we vacate the very place where our healing power lies. We leave the body temple, the place where the mind, body, and spirit merge. Wow. That's impressive. So, That's a beautiful phrase, a passage, I should say. And I, I noticed that I was uh, really resonating with something you said at the beginning. Uh, we collapse the breath, or I'm sorry, we collapse the breath and our self-esteem. And I know right. that I thought, now that's an interesting turn of phrase. I hadn't thought of that before. Um, but, you know, I think it's very true. I th first of all, in Western culture, we don't even really spend much time focusing on our breath at all. It's only, only in recent years that Eastern teachings have started to make their way into the Western culture, and people are now starting to learn more about the power of the breath. And, you know, the concept of, of meditation and and learning all different kinds of uh, breathing techniques and pranayama and all that stuff. So, you know, I'm glad you mentioned that. And I think it's a really, really important point. So thank you for that. You're welcome. I just wanted to put everything in context. What is chronic pain and what does it do to us in terms of, you know, the body? And yeah. uh, that's the journey is to come back within. That's the journey. Yeah. Chronic yeah. pain is, is to come that's back. Right. Yep. And that's really been my journey in recovery is to is to feel all this stuff um, because I learned, as I said, as a youngster, um, I was uh, I was so suppressed and I didn't know what to do with any of that stuff. And um, in my genius as a child, I literally dissociated. So mm. my old patterning is to get the hell out of my body in every way possible, energetically, when things get, you know, crazy. And when things hurt and uh, and so my recovery has been the opposite of that. And yeah. it's very powerful. It's a very powerful practice. Um, but it's that's that's kind of the essence of recovery. And, and, I, and I'm sure that you, 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 you understand what I'm talking about. Of course, of course. And, you know, you, you said something that I think is very important uh, for people to understand. It's quite natural for us to want to avoid pain. Uh, <laughs> pain is uncomfortable. It hurts. Who wants to experience that forever, you know? So it makes perfect sense that we try and find some ways of, of avoiding it and, and staying away from pain. And it's counterintuitive to, to understand that in order to really heal that pain, we have to go into it. We exactly. Have to, yeah. And that's, you know, you'll, you'll continue to avoid and avoid and avoid and avoid until it gets to a point where you can't avoid it anymore. Then... All right, you'll do the only other thing that's left and you'll go into it. Hopefully you'll do that before it reaches a stage where you want to terminate your life. I, I don't want anybody to do that because there really is a way through this. There e really is a way to, to heal and to get better and to, and to, well, as we're talking today, reclaim the body temple. So now you, uh, okay. So is there anything else you want to say about this before we move ahead with the next point? No, I just, wanted to, I just wanted to bring that in. Yeah, great. Well, I'm glad you did. And and don't hesitate to, to, to interrupt with new ideas as they come up, because that's the nature of this show. We're talking about life mastery, and no one of us has all the answers. So what we do is we come together, we share what we know, and hopefully we expand the knowledge so even more people know it. But I want to get back to this topic now of this ancestral clearing. Now you, 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 I brought it up, but it was something that you and I had discussed beforehand. And I want to make sure that we frame this properly. Why on earth would anybody even contemplate doing an ancestral clearing? And is it even necessary? Mm -hmm. Well, let's figure out what it is, right? So the, the premise of ancestral clearing is <clears throat> we come into this life with the gifts and the burdens of our ancestors. And I'll give you an example. Gifts are resilience, ability to fight a disease, for instance, strength, strong bones. So kind of the DNA side of the, of the coin. Yes. Um, that would be the what I would call the, the DNA, maybe the hardwiring, skin color, hair color, eye color. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then there's the epigenetic, which is the softer wiring, which is changed by the environment affects that. 
Right. Okay. And <clears throat> the burdens that we carry are things like trauma from war, from environmental catastrophes, from heartbreak, <clears throat> from those kinds of things, persecution. If those things don't get resolved in our ancestors, that gets passed forward genetically, epigenetically, but genetically. And <clears throat> we see this in mice, mice in the lab. We've, we've actually, there's hard science on this. Um, we also see it in um, uh, descendants of civil war, uh, uh, people that were in the civil war here in America. And we see it in the descendants of Holocaust survivors. And we see it in um, now at this point, we see it in 9-11 survivors and their offspring and their descendants. So, and I've worked, we work with this in this practice in the ancestral clearing practice, we work with at that level with right. people. So, um, and it, it addresses <clears throat> any pattern, physical, emotional, spiritual, financial, it doesn't matter. This practice helps, it addresses all of that. It's the only modality that I know Tapping's pretty close. Um, it's the only modality that I know that that uh, complements every other healing modality out there, right. and 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 it, it doesn't harm in any way. So it's a it's a beautiful practice. Um, so, so just let me summarize. So, so this is mostly focused on we somehow uh, collect all the energy from our you know, our, our parents and our grandparents and our great grandparents mm -hmm. and so forth, things that they went through, traumatic experiences and so forth, somehow get passed through the lineage into where we are today. So this is not quite the same thing then as uh, clearing out energy from past lives that we ourselves may have experienced at some other point in time. Is that, is, am I correct in that? We actually cover all that. We cover kind of all all realms. Uh, it's just it's just easier to explain it in terms of a direct line. Got it. But we, we do cover because when we do the process, it's interesting uh, the past lives that show up as as a as a part of the process that we do, and we whatever shows up, we we do the work on that. Um, what we're what we're doing is is I, I just want to be super precise. The things that get passed down to us as energetic um, negatively are the things that our ancestors were not able to resolve. I see. So if they, if they were able to heal from it in their own lifetime, it doesn't become an issue. But Got when it. they don't, it's an issue. And I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. My parents were both in, in the Second World War. My dad was in the Pacific. My mom was the Atlantic. <clears throat> they both experienced trauma. They had no idea what to do with all that. They carried it because they didn't know how to resolve it. And <clears throat> they came home after the war, they got married. They had two kids, my brother and I, and when we were born, we took it on, we felt it. And I yeah. felt it in the family. Now I couldn't name it at that point, but I felt the energy of it. And <clears throat> it was like this black shroud. And uh, uh, I never know what it was until I, I got into this practice and I was like, aha, now I know what that is. And I was able to clear it. So I don't carry that anymore. This is an example. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. I, yeah, I totally get it. And I understand it. And some of the work that I do, I is basically uh, what I call shadow healing, shadow healing and integration. And I think that there's definitely a correlation between the shadow healing work and your ancestral clearing work. Because often when I'm, when I'm dealing with someone who is, is maybe trying to heal some unconscious energy, that issue may have something to do with a past life or with a, with a you know, ancestral kind of relationship, although it isn't necessarily articulated in that way during our session. And, uh, but I know exactly, I think I know exactly what you're talking about now. I think I've experienced it myself. Um, so, yeah. Now, I haven't personally had the the honor or the pleasure of 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 of, a, of recognizing, let's say, that I've had a past life. You know, I believe that it's possible that we all have, but my my current memory doesn't 
doesn't ever tell me, oh yeah, I can remember doing something like that in a previous life. Um, some people, however, have a different kind of structure and they're able to tap into those past lives much more easily than I can. And so I, I guess now we, we have this different kind of energy. If I had, let's say I had a past life a few hundred years ago or a thousand years ago or however many years ago it was, and something traumatic happened to me then that I didn't resolve, you're saying that somehow I can be carrying that forward in my current incarnation. Is that right? You bet. You bet. I'll tell you an example. So my background's in science. I, yeah. I have a degree in plant science, and uh, and my background really is in like evolutionary biology, human uh, animal behavior, um, ecosystems. Mm -hmm. That's where the plant science comes in. So that's kind of my that's a, there's a big part of me that's there. The other right. part of me is the spiritual side. So I've got a foot in both places. And what, what's, what's, what's interesting to me <clears throat> is that uh, our soul seems to record all of it. I didn't have any idea about past life. I don't know what that is. I was kind of like you. I've never had that experience. I didn't say it didn't exist. I just had, didn't have an experience of it. So right. I was very neutral. And I was, my ancestor clearing teacher was running to take me through an ancestor clearing one day. And he's part of the process is wait for a memory. And I'm sitting there and I'm just waiting for, because you're not looking for a memory. You're just waiting. That's different. Mm -hmm. So a memory comes up, right? It's very different. And all of a sudden there's this memory of me and there's like this fire and there's people looking at me and I'm on this pole and I'm like, what did I do wrong? And I'm like, what is this? This didn't happen in this lifetime. <laughs> I yeah. was being burned at the stake. Right. Yeah. And I, I was like, what? And my ancestral clearing teacher knew exactly what it was, but I had no idea. He, you know, because he's been doing this for 30 years. I've only been doing it for six and a half. So I was wow. just, I don't burned, know. I burned at the stake. Pardon me? You did say burned at the stake. I that was the memory. Yeah. Wow. That was memory. Yeah. Oh my god. So I, I've yeah. heard, you know, I, I I've heard about it the same way as that most people do. And just the thought of being burned at the stake terrifies me. I know. I was like, and it, and but the memory of it was was not of terror for me it was like i'm trying to help you people <laughs> i right. i was trying to help heal people and they and they they thought i was you know whatever so i was being sure. it was judgment and i was and i was hurt and, and and also the other thing at that point was um um i felt forsaken by by my higher power at that point in in that memory at that moment and so we did clearing around that interesting interesting and so how long does a typical ancestral clearing process take for somebody? And is there any way that we could do like a really short one here just to get people to can. We can, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm going to offer a prayer. But uh, <clears throat> an ancestral clearing session, I'm sorry, David, you're lagging behind me a little bit. I I can see your, I can't, can't hear you talking, but I can see you, your mouth moving. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. I think it might be your, uh, your uh, internet connection. Cause I've noticed a little bit of lagging on your end too, but that's I all right. Can't. Just keep going. Pretend everything's yeah, perfect. I can't, I can't do anything. Okay. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I can do a clearing. I mean, we can do a clearing in 30 seconds on one subject. It's, it can be that quick. But most sessions uh, go for uh, 25 minutes to 50 minutes. I do regularly 50-minute sessions. Yeah. And uh, we cover a lot of ground. Um, I like to kind of take the time and let the client get a, get a kind of a feel for the process and get them to kind of relax and and because uh, we can go deeper that way. Um, and uh, but I would I would I would love to there it's so we we use. Uh, as a practitioner, I sit as a in kind of in a blank space, a place of of, of um, meditative, kind of like the space between thoughts. 
Mm-hmm. When I mean blank, I mean like I'm just sitting open, holding the space for the client. And we, because the client is asking for help, you don't really have to have a, a belief in a higher power for this. You don't have to have a belief in a higher power for this process to work. But if you have one, we we invoke its name. And it's really, um, we're asking this source energy, the source of all it is, to help us clear this stuff. As very, I can't do this. I don't know how to, I'm not that smart. I'm not that powerful. But source energy certainly is. And we, so we're, that's what the conversation is. Right. And what we do is we ask for, uh, we use some, we, we, we work around forgiveness and which means like letting go, clearing the charge around an issue, that kind of thing. Okay. And I, I'd be happy just to do a, gen, gen, a generational cleansing prayer right now. Sure. Absolutely. Let's do it. So we'll we'll just use the source of all it is for for our 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 source right source of all it is for everyone on this call and the replay for us our families our entire lineage and all humanity throughout all time past present future all realms lifetimes and incarnations please help us all to forgive each other. All people forgive us completely and totally now and forever. Please and thank you. Please and thank you. Please and thank you. Amen. Lovely. That's very short, but lovely. Yeah. That and is a very powerful word medicine that I just. Yeah, I yeah I can feel it. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and you know, invoking the the power of forgiveness in both directions, I think that's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we don't know what happened in the lineage, so we make sure that we're working the equation both ways. So we would forgive yeah. for um, any time uh, uh, we were abandoned, not loved or nurtured the way we <laughs> we uh, we needed, times we abandoned others, weren't able to love and support them the way they needed, times we weren't able to support ourselves and love ourselves the way we needed. Right. Please help right. us all forgive each other, help, them, help all people forgive us. Help our help us forgive ourselves, please, and thank you. Yeah, beautiful, very nice. And I noticed you mentioned that you, when you're when you're doing this as a practitioner, you try to adopt a kind of a meditative state, a a, a space between thoughts. I think you said. And so, tell us more about the the meditative side of it and how important that is, and the stillness and breath and all that kind of thing. Great question. Um, the it's kind of hard to teach it, but I'll explain it the best I can because I had to find my way into that. Sure. Uh, my teacher pointed me to it, and then I had to have the experience. So my ego um, wants to run the show, and that's not how this work is. So you and I are having this conversation, and my my uh, my my um, I'm kind of in both places at once here mm-hmm. um, because we're having this flow. We're in a flow state right now. So that's, sure. that's close to kind of meditative. My ego um, can get in the way. As soon as it thinks it's doing the work that we're bringing in, uh, then the work isn't either. It's not going to work or I'm going to take on whatever that person has that they're trying to let go of. Yep. So been there, it, done it, that. <laughs> Yeah, right. So we want to stay very neutral. And the way to stay neutral is to relax and allow. And the ego kind of takes a seat. And I'm really at the, I'm really listening to, I don't know how else to say it, the download that's coming in. Um, It's, I don't know how else to say it. Um, For instance, I, I kind of have, have already had a download about your, your lineage. And and if we were in a, please. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I don't know what you're You're, you feel free to share whatever you like about it. Yeah. So I, I, there's someone in your lane, what I was getting, and I've learned not to argue with what comes in. So, because 
I just, it's amazing how dead on it is all the time. Um, I saw you, uh, someone in your lineage as, as, a, as an explorer in America, as like a, like a, like a, like a guide through the woods. And, um, uh, they were uh, befriended uh, the, uh, a native, uh, an indigenous uh, per person and learned how to translate for them. Hmm. And so uh, it, it, just like you were not just a guide, you were a translator between the uh, settlers, the European settlers and the, the, uh, the indigenous people. Now that's the download I got. I, I didn't, uh, I haven't done, I mean, I haven't, we haven't done the process. I'm just saying, it's, it's what happens as a result of this process. I've been doing this almost every day for six and a half years uh, around the planet with somebody. And, and I just, it, it, I've gotten to the point where I, I sit with a person for three or four minutes and I, I've I kind of already got a, a beat on kind of what, what's going on with them. So it's, it's, it's not, I'm not trying to invade your privacy or anything. It's just what happens. No, no, no. It's perfectly, uh, it's perfectly okay. I mean, well, I, I, I've done enough work on myself now that pretty much all of the secrets that I am aware of have been revealed somewhere. Does so, that make any sense what I just said about your, your, your lineage? Well, that, that's a new one because, as I said, I haven't had the experience of, of an actual uh, uh, past life situation. I haven't had that happen yet. But what you said kind of resonates for you know as as being potentially true for me, even though I don't remember it. It doesn't feel like an actual memory in my in my mind. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I appreciate the information. Thank you. It, it'd be more like a body thing. You wouldn't it, the mind wouldn't necessarily take it in. The yeah. body would recognize. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's what I'm saying. I, I could feel something down here. So, and it feels consistent with how I'm showing up in this lifetime too. So. Yeah, um, I don't see myself as a translator specifically between two human languages, but I, I do see myself as a facilitator where my, my, my job now is to help people find their own truth. I don't necessarily know what that truth is, but I, I help them find their own truth. And I, I have the tools, I know the skills to, to make that happen in the same way that you know how to help people clear this energy that may be blocking them. So you and I are both doing the same sort of thing, but with using different approaches. And, That's and I, think it, I think it's awesome. I think it's beautiful. awesome. Yeah. That's beautiful. But, but let's talk a little bit more about this, this meditation thing now. I mean, I know you teach, you teach people, I believe, to meditate and to get into stillness for themselves. So sure. tell me why you do that and, and why you think that is so important. Oh, well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'll tell you that, and then I'll tell you kind of how, what, what my approach is. Sure. Um, so in chronic pain, the mind, the brain, the brain, the nervous system becomes very chaotic. Um, the It's just on high alert. The stress response is out of control. Um we're always in pain. So we're, we're, we, we, it's very difficult. We don't get rest. Right? right. So the, the whole nervous system is thrown out of whack. And so we've got all this chaos up here. So the first, so what we want to do, and, and the, and the brain is changed in that way by chronic pain. So in order to heal chronic pain, we need to bring modalities in that will help normalize those changes, heal those changes. Meditation would be the number one thing. The most, that's the thing I bring in the first. But, well, actually the first thing I do is do an ancestral clearing for people just because so that they can sit still. But the, the second thing I do is, is I bring in meditation because that helps to quiet the mind and calm the brain mm -hmm. and give the nervous system the signal that it's safe because we don't feel like we're safe. And so the nervous system is constantly going off. So that's, that's the value of meditation. The other thing that I noticed um, uh, very, very much from having done all this work myself, um, the negative mind, we already have a tendency towards negativity already when we're healthy. Uh, our first response to something new is no, because that's a, that's to keep us safe. That's kind of old uh, wiring. Um, it's in the DNA. Uh, it, it, it takes some um, 
it takes the frontal brain, the processing of, oh, what's really happening here to, um, which is a newer thing, uh, to discern that new thing. So we already have a sense of, of negativity. In chronic pain, it's worse. It's much worse. So um, we have this incredible load of negativity in chronic pain. Meditation helps to clear that, especially the Kundalini yoga part that I that I that I bring in. So it's the reason that I took this particular kind of yoga. Kundalini yoga and meditation are really they cut like like a hot knife through butter through this negativity. And I have personal experience with that. Yeah. Yeah. So the well, first I did, thing I had my own experience with meditation and uh, what I believe that the power of meditation for me has been helping me to become more present to the to, to this moment, rather than, as you mentioned early at the beginning of the show, you know, dwelling on the past or, or worrying about the future. Those those issues are all about the ego mind trying to run the show. If we can come to the present moment through the breath as one way. And in fact, any kind of focused flow also helps to, to bring us into the present moment. So you don't have to be sitting still. You don't have to be, you know, holding a particular posture. You don't have to do any of that stuff. Those are helpful. And certainly if you want to get serious about meditation, I think those are the way to go because then you can just sit quietly and focus on what's going on internally. But until you get used to that, then simply trying to stay present in the current moment can be very, very helpful. Even if you're, you know, chopping carrots for a salad or, uh, you know, mopping the floor or doing the dishes or taking the dog out for a walk, any of these things, any of these activities that you do, you can do in full presence. That's it's right. Not, yeah, it just takes a moment. You know, I mean, I notice, for example, I take my dog out for a walk twice a twice a day now, and every time I go out with him, I try to be just with him. You know, I like to observe him and watch him as he gets all excited and do his thing, and 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 every once in a while, I notice my ego mind's coming up. And, oh yeah, there we go. Let's get present again. It's it's a wonderful, wonderful practice. And when I'm present. There is no pain. There is no suffering. There is all that stuff just kind of disappears. It's a beautiful, beautiful practice. I'm just so glad that you that yeah. you are bringing that forward. Oh, you're you're right, and thank you. Yeah. Um, the I call um, I call the present moment the healing field. Oh, that's so nice. The, I like that. the past the past is finished. The future hasn't happened yet. And where does healing happen? It happens right here. So the healing field is right here. We just have to learn to stay here. And that's, that's you know. Well, that's a beautiful out. phrase. I, I've never heard anyone use that phrase before. So I'm going to steal it. And I'll probably be using it a lot now. The healing uh, the healing field. I like it's that. In my book. I, 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 I termed it in the book. I coined it in the okay. book. Yeah. And you could go ahead. Yeah, it's it's. <laughs> No, it's it's a great it's a great phrase. I really like it, and I'm I'm going to use it. So, uh, thank you for sharing that. So now let let's t come back a bit more to the breath and and this whole idea of breath power, because you you talked about this right at the very beginning, this idea of the importance of breath and how the breath collapses when we go into pain and all that. So tell us a little bit about how you bring more attention to the breath and how you help people to become more expansive rather than collapse. Great. So, so let's just kind of understand what's going on there from a biology point of view. The lungs, <clears throat> there are these things in the lungs called alveoli, where the oxygen uh, comes in and the and the waste product goes out. And they're they're uh, they're in the lung there, and but about fifty percent of them are at the base of the lung. Actually, more than fifty percent are at the base of the lung. Mm. So. And just to be clear, when you say the base of the lung, you mean like the lower portion down closer to the diaphragm. Is that right? That's right. I just want to make sure. Because the lungs go from, you know, up in the upper part of the chest all the way down to the uh, and down at the bottom of the rib. Yeah. So, so this is what we do. We shallow breathe. And when we shallow breathe, meaning we're only using the upper third or maybe the upper half if we're lucky, right? 
when we shallow breathe, we get a, uh, we're not oxygenating all the cells and we're getting a buildup of waste product in the base of the lung. And then we wonder why we get a headache or we don't feel very well. Maybe we have brain fog because we're not breathing. So it's that simple. So people say, well, how can breathing be that simple? You know, how can it be that, that powerful? Well, it's that simple. It really is. It can't, it, they say it can't be that simple. And I'm like, yeah, actually it can. So we take a full breath in and we take a full breath out and we do that five or six times. Um, uh, and we'll notice a change and we're like, ah, that feels better. So it's, uh, and that's just as kind of as a practice during the day. Uh, one of my favorite places to, to, to stop and take this nice, beautiful, deep breath to remind myself, cause I get busy with my mental stuff, uh, chores and errands and this and that appointments and stuff is when I'm waiting, waiting at a red light, waiting in the grocery line, waiting at the bank, we do a lot of waiting in our lives. It's a great time to get, as you say, get present and take that nice deep breath. The other thing that happens, so that's the teaching there. And the other thing is that when we get um, fearful, we take a big breath in and hold it. And that tells the nervous system, be on alert, you're in trouble, get ready to run or freeze or fight. And, um, so, and, and that's, that's the essence of an anxiety attack, by the way, mm -hmm. fearful energy, a story with it, ah, and we hold our breath. So how do you get out of that? A panic attack, an anxiety attack, you let out the breath. The first thing you do is you exhale, nice, long exhale, and then nice, even inhale, exhale five or six, seven times will help reset the nervous system to know that it's safe. The other trick, an old yogi trick is just breathe through the left nostril three to 11 minutes. It stimulates the calming center in the brain. Inhale, exhale, just through the left nostril, stimulates the calming center in the brain, calms you right down three to 11 minutes. That's it. It's magic. Yeah. It's magic. <laughs> you know, it's interesting that you talk about how we shallow breathe. Uh, I, you know, I think it's an epidemic problem, to be honest. Um, but it seems to be more of a problem in Western culture than it does in Eastern culture. And I think that's because they have spent so many years learning about yoga in, and stuff in, in Eastern culture. And uh, we're only infants in that particular learning. The question that I have in my mind is, how did we get to this place in the first place where Shallow breathing seems to be an okay thing to do and something that everybody does. Why have we not spent more time focusing on our breath and helping people to learn more about proper breathing techniques? Why has it taken us so long to get here? Now, I mean, it doesn't really matter why, but I, I just find it curious that that's, that seems to be the way it is here. Have you, well, have you have an answer for that? or I have a comment that I'd like to make. I agree with you and I have a comment about it. We'll go back to my childhood and your childhood because it was probably similar to you. My family was all about the mind. Now I, they were athletes, and but we came up with the 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 the, um, the mantra with them was no pain, no gain. So they were always pushing the body, and it was all about how high are your grades, how good are your grades. Yeah. They didn't. They didn't hope that I would get. I would excel in school. They expected it. So yeah. it was all about the mind and the body. Kind of the body got was like the side issue, <laughs> right? And and so this is where we are when we have that kind of an imbalance. You know, in in Western medicine, they've tried to separate mind, body, spirit, but in the Eastern and and, and Near Eastern philosophy and medicine, Ayurvedic and, and traditional Chinese medicine, there's no separation between mind, body, and spirit. And science, Western science, is now finally beginning to recognize that. Yeah. You cannot separate mind, body, and spirit. So when your body is under pressure, your spirit is under pressure. Sure. 
Yeah. And yeah. when your spirit is under pressure, so is your body. And this, this is a this is a fundamental teaching that we've missed in this country. Right. And it's all very important stuff. And I'm sure glad that, you know, you and I at least are are doing our part to try and raise awareness about this. I think this is it's it's very important. Yeah. And, I, you know, I, this this thing about the breath, I, you know, I've learned a lot of different techniques for breathing, too. I remember I never really thought much about my breath at all until short, you know, a few years after I quit smoking, <laughs> 1985 or so, I started doing swimming and I started gaining weight. So I was looking for ways of, of avoiding gaining weight. So I started swimming. Now, swimming kind of got a little boring. Then I started doing some running. Now, when I started running, that's when I really started noticing my breath. I started paying attention to my breath because, you know, I would I would be running and I would be panting in no time. I said, I can't keep running at this pace if I'm going to be panting. So I had to teach myself how to breathe in a way that would allow me to be more controlled. So I learned a, a very, very simple technique that helped me and might help other people. I started counting how many steps I would take for an exhale. And then I would count how many steps does it take for an inhale? And I would try to hold that at a constant pace. And as I ran faster, I noticed I could not hold it anymore. I would, I would you know, eventually want to breathe more rapidly. So I might go from four paces to three paces or something like that, or eventually down to two paces if I'm really sprinting. But what I noticed is, when I exhale, if I if I can if I take the exhale and I control that, the inhale takes care of itself. That's right. You got it. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. And and the beauty is so so all the technique. Now I can't run anymore because I, I spent so much. I was doing the no pain no gain thing for years. I was trying to see how fast I could go, how far I could go. I did do a marathon, but I eventually injured myself to the point where I couldn't run anymore. So meanwhile, I had to find other things to do, and I started learning yoga. And that's when I really started paying close attention to the breath. And, you know, most of the, uh, of the techniques that I've learned, they teach you focus on the exhale. So if you want to take a deep breath, exhale as much as you can mm -hmm. before you inhale to your maximum. And so I started doing that and I discovered, yeah, I can take in a lot more when I do it that way. And then when I exhale again, I push as much air as I can out. And then when I think I'm at the bottom, I push again until I can keep getting it out. So I've learned a lot of different techniques, and I totally resonate with what you're saying. The breath is so important. Let's focus more attention on our breath so that we can focus more attention internally on, our, on, our, on who we are and what we are. Beautiful teaching. That's lovely. I'm, I'm going to remember that the next time I'm, I'm, uh, I'm out. I get on a recumbent. I don't run, but I I um I get on a recumbent bike, and the breath there is interesting. Yeah, to, sure. I'm always, I'm always messing with the breath, and I'm gonna I'm gonna try your thing just to see how it works. That's cool. Well, Thank anytime you. Anytime you're doing anything that that is a kind of an aerobic exercise, obviously your breathing is going to get more intense. Uh, just naturally, that's just part of what happens. Um, and so, yeah, you can focus at that point and say, okay, let's see if I can control this, you know, and it might be hard at first. It certainly was for me when I first started doing it, but then I would just keep doing it. Every time I went out, it would be the same thing. It's so, definitely yeah. retraining. We have to retrain ourselves because we've been working this old conditioned breath sequence for years and years and years, and we have to begin a, a new. And it was doable. Right. We just have to continue. Yeah. So... This is an awesome conversation. I'm loving this. I'm having a great time with you. This is really good. I like, I like the exchange. And I, and, I, and I know that we're getting close to our time here. So I want to make sure we cover this one final point about ending the cycle of, of suffering. I know this is something that's really important to you. And I'd just like to talk a little bit about that and so we can have a nice, nice closing portion. Okay. Can I, I'm just going to drop the offer in the, in the chat box here just so I don't forget. All right. And um, so let's just tell people what it is. It's a free download of the of the first of the introduction and the first chapter of the book of my of my book, uh, The Way Through Chronic Pain, Tools to Reclaim Your Healing Power. And uh, so you can get a, a sense of the book and, and if it's for you. And um, there you go. So the cycle of suffering is uh, is, is kind of a core piece in the book. Um, 
This is what we do when we suffer. And I identified the only reason I didn't find this somewhere. I just, dis I discovered it within myself. So sure. I was like, Oh, I've got to call this something. Cause it's a, it's this thing, right? <laughs> it's you, a thing I'm going to create. It. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Here's what happened. So we get, we have, we have pain and it's chronic and we can't share that with anybody. In, in experientially, we're unable to share that. And also people are very uncomfortable around people in pain. I know because I've seen people react. And so we get disconnected. We get disconnected from ourselves because we don't want to even be in this body. So it's at least energetically, we disassociate. We get disconnected from other people, from our friends. We get disconnected from our family. And we can even get disconnected from source thinking like, you know, what did I do wrong? Maybe I feel like I'm being blamed or punished, you know, whatever the story is. So that's the first step. We get disconnected. Then once we get disconnected, we're, we get attached. We're trying, we're, 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 we're in relationship with this thing. Right? We're disconnected, but we're still attached to the pain. So we, we have this attachment and then we try and control it because we don't want it. So, you know, the Chinese finger puzzle, that's what it's like. Yeah. The more you pull, the more you get stuck in, yeah, right? Like this, I think, so, is it? Yeah. So we try and control it. And this next step is we realize we can't control it and we get a resentment and we get really angry, right? And then the whole thing starts all over again because we got nowhere to go with our anger except to be more disconnected and more attached to this thing I can't let go of. And, you know, I want to control. I can't. I'm going to get even more angry. And it's this cycle of suffering. And it's this negative downward spiral that we do. Right. Now, I saw it in myself and I was like, this is amazing that I'm doing this right now. The good news is, I mean, the, the good news is once we identified it, that the awareness is amazing as it's, it's the first step. And the second thing is there's a way out, right? Because but the first step is awareness. So it's just important to know that we're in this cycle. It's right. a self feeding. Did you notice it's self feeding? Sure. And as so, the cycle progresses, I'm sure that the pain levels are starting to go up too. You bet. Yeah. This whole thing just, you know, it just amplifies. Yeah. So it's important that we know what we're up to. And it's not just me. I've sat in front of thousands of chronic pain patients over the years, over this, what, 40 some years. And, uh, and we all do this. I recognize it right away. As soon yeah. as I saw it myself, I said, oh man, we all do this. We're all doing this. So that's what that is. They're doing it unconsciously. That's yeah. the key. And so your that's whole point it. is a, this idea of awareness is, that's hey, I'm probably doing this even now. You know, no matter how much work I've done on myself, I may still have that cycle of suffering that I that I create within myself. And so it's it's good to bring this awareness. And this is why the breath is so important and presence is so important. Exactly. Well, wow. What can I say? <laughs> All right. Well, this has been awesome, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. Is there anything else that you'd like to say before we, we before we close out? Well, I would like to say this. The mantra, you know, is uh, that I'd like everybody to walk away with is you are your greatest healer. The healing power in your body lives in you. Absolutely. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. I think Everything that we really need, all the answers, everything that we need is within. This is why I tell people in is the only way out. We're, we're constantly seeking a way out, but it's not out there. In is the only way out. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Elizabeth. It's been just a, a total pleasure. And I, I'm so grateful that you brought all this great wisdom here today. Just want to remind folks, um, Elizabeth has shared a link on the uh, chat where you can go and grab a couple of free chapters from her, her book. Now, let me oh, just say the title of your book so I don't have to. And show us the cover once again. Sure. Uh, do the, the Way Through Chronic Pain, Tools 
to reclaim your healing power. Perfect. So that link will take them to the first two chapters of that book. And I presume that there'll be a way for them to connect with you and, and purchase the book directly if that's what they want. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Yep. Great. Thank you All so right. much. David. Yeah. So thanks again for joining me, everyone. It's been just a, an honor to be here with you all. Uh, I'm so glad you came and, and participated and watched the program. And for those who are watching uh, the recording, I hope you got a lot out of it, too. And just as a reminder, you can catch the recording of this show and every one of my other shows at my website at lifemasterytv.com. That's life-mastery-tv.com. I truly hope you enjoyed this presentation. In a few hours, you're going to receive an email with a link to a feedback page. Uh, please take a few minutes to write us an authentic, heartfelt five-star review so that we can encourage other people to come and join us uh, at future episodes and just keep spreading the message. And finally, I just want to remind you about my favorite thing of all, the life mastery mantra, something that you can practice and recite for yourself every single day. And this goes like this. I gratefully forgive the imperfect being I have been in the past. I gratefully accept the magnificent being I am right now. I gratefully welcome the evolved being I am becoming in each new moment. So until we meet again, I am David McLeod, your Life Mastery Coach, wishing you love, light, and blessings on your continuing journey. Bye-bye for now.